Greetings sailors and welcome back to other warships and a Patreon replay. This is actually the other older replay that alongside that Icarus game I put up uh, a couple of days ago I had recorded and then forgotten about and in this case it's arguably slightly worse because it's actually as you can see one of my Patreon supporter games. This is Andy CX who is a name you should be well familiar with by now if you've been watching the channel for any length of time. Now, like I said, it's another tier 6 destroyer, but it's a rather different sort of machine. It is the Farragut, and it's the last of the US destroyers, uh, tech tree destroyers anyway, that cannot stealth torp. Like the Nicholas, like the Clemson before it, I think like even the Wix, uh, basically the torp range is a lower than the detectability range. But in the case of the Farragut, it's only by 200 meters. It's not a big gap. It's also got, unlike the Nicholas, an all centerline arrangement. And actually that's kind of true for the one that follows it as well. The Mahan has one centerline mount and then two side mounts. So you have to do a little twirl if you want to use all of your torpedoes. And the Nicholas only has six torps per side. So again, you have to do a bit of a twirl. But you don't have to do that in the Farragut, which is quite a useful trait. Because sometimes you do get tempted to do that twirl and it can end up all going horribly wrong. Anyway, as you can see, it is Domination. It is a tier 7 game, so actually not bad matchmaking. And there are, what, two or three ships that have immediately decided to rush the middle. Because that's always a good plan here on Two Brothers. We'll see how that goes. There's also one enemy ship that's moved in to counter them and has been torpedoed. But yeah, one of the ships that's in the middle is actually their top tier destroyer, the Mayhan. And that's not an ideal position for a destroyer to be. And of course, the enemy team is now going to be well aware that those ships are in there also. Andy, meanwhile, is countering the enemy destroyer in this cap which turns out to be the Nicholas. The Nicholas does have better stealth. In fact the Nicholas has pretty good stealth. It just also has a really short torpedo range. It's like five and a half kilometers. So uh, yeah it could easily outspot Andy's 6.6 .6, but they came dashing out of that smoke at a close enough range to get spotted and Andy has chosen to open fire. That's a little bit of a risky proposition, but we can see there's not that many enemies on this flank. Probably the riskiest thing is that uh, that Omaha that is right on the, the line there. But he's also got a fair number of allies backing him up here. So he's he's not doing this in a an, an isolated environment. He's, he's taking this risk in the knowledge that he has allies that hopefully will be backing him up and shooting at these things that might be shooting at him. He's also got the knowledge that if he doesn't move things forward with this Nicholas, these allies might just be stuck here. Because the other flank, yeah, with those ships in the middle, the other flank, the uh, sea cap uh, is basically completely um, outnumbered. We've actually just lost the Nicholas that was there. The Mayhan in the middle just got taken out, although they then uh, took out the ship that took that out. But that's one of their destroyers gone. In fact, that's both of their other destroyers gone. So Andy is now in the position of being the sole remaining destroyer. And with so many other ships being on the other side of the map, this flank basically needs to be able to get moving. They need to not be tied down here. So Andy is being quite aggressive with this Nicholas. So QP is away, the Nicholas is respotted, and there's a couple of defense flags as well. And we really have to hope that Duke of York is not lo that that they don't have their HE shells loaded. That's I mean I said the Omaha was a threat, and certainly Omaha is a threat when you're in a destroyer, but uh, the uh, the 14 inch British HE that the Duke of York and the uh, uh, KGV both have available is very nasty but fortunately for Andy they are firing AP at things other than him so he's able to just do a little bit of maneuvering wait for the cooldown timer to uh, expire on him being spotted and he does get a few shells coming in from that Gneisen out there and also comes maybe a little uncomfortably close to those Nicholas's torpedoes but uh, yeah they they all mess he takes minimal damage from the shell fire so they now have this cap and they can now maybe push a bit there are at this stage though more ships piling through the middle 
the enemy Mayhan is just sitting there waiting for them. So that looks like, what, four ships? It, it, basically, the ships that were over towards the sea flank, uh, but a lot of them bailed and are now just pushing through the middle, and that very rarely works out. But it's distracting some of the enemy ships, I suppose. There's a Colorado that's over on that other flank as well, and I genuinely can't tell if, if they... Like, they seem to be moving around a little bit, but yeah, in terms of Colorado, you can't leave it till that stage of things to get moving. You can't be sat at the back, be stationary, and then once the flank is overrun, think, oh, maybe I should actually start to manoeuvre a bit. It's far too late when you're in a ship like the Colorado. You really have to keep a very sharp eye on what's happening on the minimap and what's happening on the flank that you're on. Because if you need to make a getaway, you can't exactly do it very quickly. So, there's been a bit of a massacre in the middle. There's now, what, two allied ships left. The Gneiser now is going for, what is that, uh, the, uh, some kind of cruiser. Is that the, the, yeah, it is, the, the tier six uh, 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 Dutch cruiser. I forgot the word Dutch there for a second because reasons. And now it's just the Cavour facing down an angry Gneiser now with torpedoes. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> the other flank went terribly and the fight in the middle went fairly terribly, although it did cost the enemy team some ships. But if they had played a little more conventionally, I think things might be slightly... Uh, less on a on a knife edge at the moment, at least in terms of ship numbers. In points, the enemy team is ahead. Is ahead, although they have just evened things out a little bit by taking out that Duke of York. So we know there's a mayhem there. We know the Gneiser now is in the middle. The Gneiser now is probably going to continue down to the uh, the the southern cap. The southern cap's the C cap, isn't it? it? Was the D cap I meant when I was saying C cap earlier? Anyway. Uh, the Mayhan might still be around, they might also have chosen to go down the middle, we don't know. And uh, there we go, just lost the Colorado. There's also a New Mexico that's down there as well, that's probably also not going to last very long, versus those several enemy ships. And undoubtedly, they're going to lose the sea cap. So there's the Mayhan, it's actually just kind of hanging around, and I think trying to position themselves to drop torpedoes, but they weren't really in motion or anything like that, they've just sat still and smoked up. The Farragut does outspot the Mayhem, but only by a little bit, so uh, yeah, the, 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 they will have had a little bit of reaction time uh, to work with, but that's still not something you would bank on, especially with several enemy ships coming towards you, and certainly when you're not on uh, full health. So, there goes the Mayhem, actually get taken up by the Heinrich secondaries, and... Andy helps Cap and uh, then gets an unwelcome surprise because the enemy California has actually come back this way. Seemingly on their own. I don't know why you would do that, especially in a California. I mean, they're healthy, but that's one ship versus multiple ships. That's usually not a good plan. And it's not like the California is great. You really don't see them around very often, and there's a good reason for that. It's not particularly fun to play, and it's not particularly effective as a tier 7 battleship. It looks nice, though. I will give it that. It's one of those ones where you can look at the model in port and go, Wow, what a gorgeous looking model. It's just a pity about actually playing the thing. Anyway, that's within top range. But the spread on these means that he's unlikely to get any kind of dev strike. Uh, he will, I think, get at least one, yeah, there we go, two, actually, but uh, not a huge amount of damage. I think one caught the belt, and so it will have been far from uh, a, a, a huge hit. Now, rather than keep sitting in the smoke, Andy actually chooses to go forwards here, and if you look at the minimap, you can see his allies are pushing, including, there we go, the Prince Heinrich, so he's banking on that... California shooting other things and he may or may not also be aware that the California has a fairly slow reload It's one of the reasons why it's not especially fun to play slow reload on a small caliber of gun is uh, generally not a great combo and uh, while the uh, the California looks like they are not gonna last too much longer While this is all happening the enemy team is taking a 
So we are still at a big disadvantage in points. I mean, we lost the New Orleans that had stayed behind to try and defend A. Again, not really a great plan. So we've got people on both teams making rather questionable decisions. And talking of people on both teams, we, we had this New Mexico who had, I guess, belatedly turned around to try and support the California. Now this is looking like a bit more of an even fight, or at least it would have if him and the California had been together, but as it is, the California is very nearly dead. And uh, all the more attractive a target because they really need the kills to get the points right now. Nearly dead is not quite the same as actually dead though, and rather than assume somebody else is going to finish them off, Andy, as a little precaution, puts his torpedoes out and is now going to try and position to pew pew this New Mexico a bit. It's also about 30-ish seconds away from smoke and ah, we can also see the B cap is being taken so yes yeah, somebody has come back through the middle. It's been rather heavily trafficked in this game overall and is about to flip the B cap. The torpedoes do finish off the California though. It takes two hits, so I'm guessing the California had started a heal. But also I think the Farragut's torpedoes aren't super powerful. I don't have the thing to hand, but yeah, I don't think they do a huge amount of damage. So you just kind of rely more on the number of them. Anyway, there goes the uh, New Mexico to the Heinrich's torps, and it actually turns out to be multiple enemy ships. It is the uh, the... Durflinger, which is a bit less dangerous, but still the, uh, the in fact, pair of Durflingers, are they in a division? They are in a division, and it's going to turn out the Gneiser now has come through the middle there as well. Now, Andy could arguably have used his last smoke here to give that Congo a bit of breathing room. We don't know if the Congo has any heals left, but even if they did, are keeping the Congo alive a little bit longer given how low health they are they're going to be a high priority target for the enemies uh, that probably would have been a sensible thing to do and even just them being able to use that smoke and sitting it in pew pew but Andy's making a slightly riskier play here I think he's hanging on to that smoke for maybe slightly selfish reasons as well but he's getting close enough that he can drop his torpedoes the Durflingers have to know this of course it's one of the disadvantages of playing these lower tier American destroyers because you cannot torp from stealth, excepting, you know, dropping torps around an island to stay out of sight or else utilizing smoke screens, people are going to know it's coming. And even if you drop a smoke screen, they're going to be able to guess there's the high probability of torpedoes coming from that smoke screen. The Durflingers aren't really able to escape the spread at this kind of range, though. Neither of them get killed by Andy's torps, but he does significantly soften them up. Now all that's left is that Gneiser now, who has proved to be one of, if not the most effective enemy player, and although Andy has still got two allies left, the Congo is going to be pretty low health, and Heinrich is a bit on the squashy side. They quite possibly are running low on, uh, or were running low on heals or repairs, but as it turns out, well, Heinrich wasn't the only one with torps. Of course, Gneisen now also has their own torpedoes, and uh, they were able to take out the Heinrich. I can't remember if Heinrich has hydro or not, but I have a feeling it does. So it might be that it had all been used up, or it might be it was on cooldown, or it might be that player just forgot about it. So this is all caution to the wind at this point. This Gneiser now has to die. I think Andy is just banking on setting fires. He knows he's not going to be able to drop torpedoes. He's out of smokes and Gneiser now secondaries are nothing to sniff at, especially if you're in a, a, a lower health destroyer. So he has got a fire going. Uh, I kind of wish we could see the Congo's health at this stage. If they'd been able to heal, they might be in a slightly better position than before. But yeah, it's still kind of a squashy ship compared to the Gneiser now. It certainly can be overmatched by the Gneiser now's guns. And uh, with only two minutes left to play, yeah, I mean, I can kind of see why Andy would want to take the risk, because even if the 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 Gneiser now, like the Gneiser now just has to run away to live and that's them that they win, so you kind of can't let that happen. And 
I, th I think Andy just doesn't want to rely on this Congo making it happen, so he's, he's taking the slightly riskier action. Some HE from the Gneiser now there. Maybe it was loaded for Andy, but they shot it out the Congo instead. But the Gneiser now does have a relatively fast reload for a battleship. And there we go. There's actually some HE coming his way, and that misses fortunately, but those front turrets will be round very soon. There's also secondary hits coming in as well. I don't think this is a secondary spec Gneiser now, but uh, you know, some some hits are occurring anyway. He's almost got this Gneiser now. Can he do it? Can he take this guy down and finish the match? And the answer is going to be yes. <laughs> Just at the very, very last, uh, well, not the last second of the match, there was still a minute and change to go, but yeah, he actually got killed and then got that. Uh, it's just a flesh wound as his final shots connected and killed the Gneisen out. So, over 2,000 base XP, and as you can see, there are actually some pretty good players on both teams. Uh, also some quite derpy players on both teams. It was kind of an odd mixture. Well, those last couple of players really did fight hard on each team, and uh, Andy certainly played a, a fairly vital role in how that game turned out. He actually sent me these screens as well, so you can see the rewards that the Heinrich and the enemy Gneisenau got, they both managed a Kraken. So they were also both fairly instrumental to how this worked out. And he certainly couldn't have won this without the Heinrich going to the efforts that they did. And the enemy Gneisenau, if they disengaged sooner, uh, and like the Durflingers came in together and if the Gneis now had maybe come in with them as well or if the Gneis now had just disengaged completely and played for time it's entirely probable they would have won and I think they were trying to disengage but of course Andy was not going to let that happen and so uh, at that stage there wasn't really much the Gneis now could do about it. Anyway, so that was a pretty good game, I thought, and uh, it's always nice to see someone doing well in these low to mid tier American destroyers. And, uh, well, you know, excepting the Clemson, which I think has still got a bit of a reputation as a seal clubber, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I don't often get sent replays for things like the Nicholas and the Gneiser now, so, uh, not Gneiser now, the Farragut. So, uh, yeah, this was an interesting one to see. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed this game, and if you have, you can do all the usual things down underneath the video, and of course, as always, stay tuned for more.